Hello, everyone. There comes a stage in the career of every pediatrician or pediatric nurse where he or she will need to be the saver of life for the newly born. Today, we are going to discuss the science and practice during these moments. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on what whichever part of the globe you are in. Welcome to another session of NNF Next, Learn from the Legends. To moderate today's session, we have two stalwarts who are doing genuine work in this field. I have great pleasure on behalf of the host team to welcome Dr. Surinder Pereira, Senior Consultant Pediatrician, President of the Perinatal Association of Private Hospitals in Sri Lanka, immediate past Vice President of Sri Lanka Medical Association, past President of Perinatal Society of Sri Lanka, country representative, Sri Lanka country representative for the Federation of Asia and Oceania Perinatal Societies, and the managing editor of Sri Lanka uh, of perinatal medicine and editor uh, uh, also of editor of Genesis, the scientific magazine. Thank you so much, Dr. Surinda, for joining us for this session. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. We also have another doyen in this field who has been doing silent work in this area. He is Dr. Vigas Goyal, another senior consultant pediatrician and the national coordinator India of the IAP NNF NRP project, who is also now elected as the coordinator of the International Pediatric Association Recitation Committee. A very humble human being, uh, a silent worker. Hearty welcome, Dr. Vigas. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. And now, I have great pleasure to invite the faculty for today's session, a true legend, Professor Myra Wyckoff. Officially, she is the chair of the Neonatal Life Support Task Force of ILCOR International License Committee on Restation. Dr. Myra is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and Director of Newborn Restoration Services at Parkland Med Memorial Hospital, a large urban hospital with over 13,000 deliveries annually. She maintains and utilizes a comprehensive neonatal restoration database and runs a neonatal restoration simulation laboratory where she does path-breaking research and training her trainees. Myra and her team have conducted multiple prospective restoration studies in the delivery room. We are all aware of some of the great studies she has published. She is also a name we always keep hearing whenever we associate ourselves with the, the neonatal restoration program. She has served on the International License Committee on Restoration, Neonatal Life Support Task Force, since 2003, for which she just finished a seven-year term as chair. She has served on the American Academy of Pediatrics Neonatal Restoration Program Steering Committee since 2006, recently served a four-year term as co-chair and is currently ILCO liaison to the committee. She serves on the AAP American Heart Association Neonatal Life Support Guidelines Writing Group which creates frustration guidelines for us and revises them every five years. Dr. Wyckoff also serves as the UTSW principal investigator for original research for the NICHD Neonatal Research Network, which conduct, conducts multi-center clinical trials and observation studies. And above all, Myra is a genuine down-to-earth human being and a true friend. Thank you so much, Professor Wyckoff, for joining us. Over to you, Myra. You're muted. 
please unmute. Thank you for having me. I'll share my screen now. So today, um, I thought that we would uh, talk about resuscitation, my favorite topic. And I thought I would give you a little bit of perspective, um, particularly about the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation and how they, um, what work they do to support guidelines in neonatal resuscitation. Um, and to give you a little bit of the North American perspective, which will have some differences, I'm sure, from your own um, guidelines an education program in resuscitation, but it's always interesting to compare a little bit. I do bring you greetings from the great state of Texas in the United States, where we have lots of longhorn cattle. And when it's not 114, which is what it's supposed to be today in Fahrenheit, um, we have beautiful flowers. But right now, everything is mostly brown um, because it's extremely hot here. I don't have anything to disclose. I don't have any industry funding and my work with ILCOR and the American Heart Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics is strictly voluntary, and I won't be discussing any off-label use of medications. So um, resuscitation guidelines across the globe start with the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation Science Review. And ILCOR's motto is their, and their goal is they want to save more lives globally through resuscitation. And so these are resuscitation councils from across the world who band together to do these science reviews. And so my, I have a question for you and, and I've, I understand that we're gonna have the ability to do a poll. I'm not very good at this, but we'll see if it works. Um, so I would like to know how many of you who are participating today think that India is represented within the resuscitation councils at ILCOR? And they, you can give me a, oh, he's got it as a yes or a no. Slight edit, apologies for that. Just made it. Okay. Yeah. It'll work. We'll just take a few seconds for people who are able to participate to see how many um, know the answer to this question. Shall we close the poll? Let's close it. All right, so 67% of you say yes, and 33% say no. And here, drum roll is the answer. <laughs> if I can advance my slides again, there we go. The answer is yes. And this is really new, um, new information because it was not until the ILCOR meeting in June, where there was a vote taken to admit India's um, Resuscitation Council Federation into ILCOR. So this is really important for you guys. And I think it's really important for ILCOR to have additional voices and perspectives from a country that has such a large population. Um, so we're really looking forward to partnering with your um, Resuscitation Council Federation um, to help us do additional science review and to get your perspectives. So welcome to ILCOR. ILCOR is composed of six different task forces that focus on um, different you know, lifespans. Then we have the adult life support, a basic life support group, a team that's focused really on education and implementation science, a first aid task force, a pediatric task force, and then of course what? we're most interested in is the neonatal life support task force. And it's each task force goal to provide high level systematic review of the world's resuscitation literature, which then serves as the scientific backbone for resuscitation guidelines that are generated from these different resuscitation councils from around the world. And so the idea is, hey, maybe we should all agree on what the science, what science exists and what it's telling us, but then each council can take that science and utilize um, and implement it and write guidelines that are specific to their local resources, 
as well as their population's um, preferences and values. Um, and these are all the different resuscitation councils in addition to yours that participate. Um, it's the Australian Resuscitation Council, New Zealand Resuscitation Council, the Inter-American Heart Foundation, which really represents some of Central and South America, the European Resuscitation Council, the American Heart Association represents um, the US, um, the Canadian Heart and Stroke Foundation, um, the South African Resuscitation Council, and then the Resuscitation Council of Asia that represents some swath of Asia, although obviously not all, um, but it certainly includes Japan, um, South Korea, um, Taiwan, and a few other um, areas, Singapore, I believe, as well. So how does this work? Um, well, we produce at ILCOR what we call a consensus on science and treatment recommendation. And so this is really, I'm gonna take you through the process of how we get to a co-star is the shortened term for this consensus on science and treatment recommendation. So we start with a PICO question and we wanna prioritize the PICO questions that we feel the clinicians at the bedside most need good science for. Um, we prioritize questions within the algorithm, steps within the algorithm that we think we haven't looked at for a long time, or maybe we've never done a science review for certain steps that have ended up in our resuscitation algorithm. So once we decide on the question that needs a systematic review, then we have to spend a good bit of time figuring out, okay, what are the important outcomes that we're gonna try to find science for? And we develop a search strategy. We do this with professional information specialists um, with their help, and then we screen and select the studies. We use um, some specialized software to do this. Um, I mean, you may have utilized this yourself, but there's several different software packages that help us do the screening and selection of studies, which include Covidence and Rayan. And then we have to register our systematic review once we have the search strategy developed in the Prospero registration. And this keeps you true to what you started out um, to do in within your systematic review so that you can't just tweak it here and there based on what you find later on. And it's kind of cheating. So we want to make sure we register our protocols and what we plan to do beforehand. Then we do the data extraction um, and we then do um, the meta analyses using the Cochrane um, formulations and, and techniques. And we use, um, we do the bias assessment. That's very important to help us understand how certain the science we are looking at is. And we use the Cochrane methodologies um, for randomized controlled trials. And then we have some other tools like the Rob2 and Robin's Eye that we can use for observational studies. Once we've evaluated the certainty of the evidence, um, <clears throat> we, we do that within evidence profile tables using GradePro. And the GRADE approach, uh, many of you are probably familiar with this, but this is what Cochrane Collaboration utilizes with all its very complex picture here. I've mentioned several of the steps already, but once you have your evidence profile tables, um, then you are ready to rate the, the certainty of the evidence as high, moderate, low, or very low. You grade down if there's a lot of bias within the studies or inconsistency, if there's indirectness or imprecision, or if there's a publication bias. But you can also grade up if the studies that you've found show large treatment effects that are consistent, if there seems to be a dose response, et cetera. And once you have that grading of the certainty of the evidence for your outcomes of interest, then the task force has a lot of debate and develops the actual guideline. Now, within grade, the strength of a recommendation reflects the extent to which the guideline panel, our task force, is confident that the desirable effects of an intervention outweigh the undesirable effects across the range of patients for whom the recommendation is intended. So if we make a strong recommendation, we are certain we have a, cert, uh, a high level of certainty that the benefits outweigh the risks of the intervention. If we make a weak recommendation, what we're saying is the certainty is not so great here with the science that we have available, but most informed people would choose this recommendation. However, a substantial number might not. 
And so we can grade the certainty from, and the, I'm sorry, the strength of the recommendation from a strong against to weak to very weak against to a very weak for something, weak to strong for something. So the strength of the recommendation is really a continuum um, divided into categories that are based on the certainty of the evidence that we've found. And this is really important as you look at documents, there's a language that goes with that. So treatment recommendations that are based on weak or very weak certainty of evidence use the words, we suggest you do something. However, if it's based on strong certainty of evidence, then we're going to use words like we recommend. And I don't know that everybody really notices that subtle difference in the language, but suggest is weak evidence, recommend is cert much certain, stronger evidence. So once we have developed our consensus on science and treatment recommendation, this takes a lot of debate and discussion. We have 19 task force members on our neonatal um, task force, as well as five additional emeritus task force members to help provide context and contribute to the debate. And then the neonatal group does something even in addition. And that is that we have a content expert group of about 50 people from across the globe that we also present to just to hear additional debate and ideas and make sure we're getting perspectives from all across the globe um, since we don't have the whole globe represented obviously on the task force with just 19 people. Um, and once we have that debate, we will develop an evidence to decision table to support our consensus on science and treatment recommendation. And then we publish in a journal, a systematic review manuscript. Once the systematic review has been submitted for publication, we also will then post our draft consensus on science and treatment recommendation to the ILCOR website. And this is something I really wanna to highlight to everyone who's listening because this is at www.ilcor.org. And when we have a new co-star on a new question that we're getting ready to finish up, we wanna make sure we get public comment on what we have written. Because sometimes we find that even though we spent hours debating every word in the document, that our audience, you guys who care about this stuff, who are gonna utilize guidelines that come from these science documents, are confused about our wording, or we haven't thought of some particular aspect, and you can contribute to that by going on, reviewing it, and putting in your comments. It's very, very helpful to the committee to get additional public comment beyond our content expert group and our task force. We usually put out a call for these comments through your home region resuscitation council. And now that you have one, we'll be sending that to your um, Indian resuscitation um, council federation, and they can send messages out to the various groups so that we can get this public comment. And then finally, um, once the co-star is completed, we may tweak it based on the public comment somewhat, then it gets included in an annual summary document that gets published. And so um, we always try to make this open access so that anyone across the world can have access to these science reviews that are published on an annual basis as a summary. Um, we, we simultaneously publish in circulation, um, resuscitation, and pediatrics. Um, which usually and and they make it open access so that even if you don't have a subscription to that particular journal, you should be able to access it. Now, these co-star documents are the first step. They're really serving as the scientific scaffolding upon which guidelines can be written. So we have an annual publication because it takes a lot of work. So we can't do every question in one year. We try to do seven to 12 reviews in a year's time and give and publish that data. And then we also do a five-year summary because our guidelines writers, our councils across the world who are writing guidelines for their countries, then take that summary document and will update their guidelines every five years. Now, if something really important changed in the interval between a five-year cycle, of course, um, councils can put out an interim guideline 
um, if they feel that's necessary, if there was new science that really suggested that a major change needed to be made quickly, that can be done. And then the final step, of course, is that we have to have an education program that helps disseminate the guideline out into our communities to our practitioners at the bedside. And so those educational materials are put out every five years. You can't be you know, thinking that you're going to put out a new guideline or a new education program every year because you would never, you would have team members who were training at different times and then you'd have chaos in the delivery room. So the five-year cycle seems to work reasonably well for guidelines and educational materials. And so for the U.S., of course, our educational material is put out by the AAP in collaboration with the American Heart Association, and that is our NRP program. We released the most recent edition, um, the eighth edition, in June of 2021, and it had to be adopted by all hospitals in the USA by January 1st, 2022. Um, and so that's what we use. And I am happy to see that you guys have developed your own program. You have your own manual and your own algorithm that you've tweaked here. Um, it looks very similar to the AAP um, US algorithm with a few mod minor modifications. Um, so that's pretty exciting to see. Okay, so since the last guidelines and program came out in 2020, we have had additional scientific reviews coming out in the annual publications. And I'm just going to quickly highlight a few of the topics that we've done since the major summary document in 2020. And so in 2021, um, we did a, a huge amount of work about umbilical cord management. For term infants, we had seven different PCOSs. Um, that we're dealing with that. For preterms, there were eight different PICO questions. Um, we also did reviews, three different PCOS questions looking at PPV devices for neonatal resuscitation, and one on the utilization of family presence during extended resuscitation. And then in 2022, we um, published this, just came out last fall, um, reviews looking at maintaining normal temperature immediately after birth in term and late preterm infants, suctioning clear amniotic fluid at birth, tactile stimulation for resuscitation immediately after birth, delivery room heart rate assessment methods to improve outcomes, um, the use of CPAP versus no CPAP for term respiratory distress in the delivery room, the use of supraglottic airways in neonatal resuscitation, and respiratory function monitoring in the delivery room and its impact on infant outcomes. Upcoming, which the 2023 annual publication will come out this year in mid-October. Um, we have looked at the rate of warming after accidental hypothermia after birth, maintaining normal temperature immediately after birth in preterm infants, heart rate assessment methods, and the diagnostic characteristics rather than patient outcomes, what are the different technologies, um, scoping, we did some scoping reviews on all the questions that have to do with cardiac compressions, and that will all be in that new document that you should expect in October of this year. All right, so here's our current algorithm for, that's used in the U.S., and I'm showing you, it's a very busy looking because I've added all the different systematic reviews that have been done recently, looking at various parts of the algorithm and what I want you to know is that we do these systematic reviews and we're looking for the best science available to us, but every step of this algorithm has many gaps in knowledge. And most of the recommendations that come out from the neonatal task force are made from very low certainty evidence. That's the hard truth. Um, and so we're constantly looking and scanning the literature for more science, better science, um, more power for our studies, all, all of that is, is it's really important because all of these steps, although we do them um, and they are based on the best science available, it is low certainty evidence. All right, so I thought we might go through some of the latest reviews, but do that in the context of um, a case that I'm gonna take you through. And then we'll look at various steps of the resuscitation and, and what the ILCOR review and science has told us. So let's say that we're on call 
and you get a call from labor and delivery and are told that there's an impending delivery of a moderate preterm infant, something that we all deal with on a fairly frequent basis. So mom is a 36-year-old G1P0. She has severe preeclampsia. Her membranes are intact. She got a dose of steroids one hour ago. Her bedside sono supports her 33-week gestational age dates. Baby's around 1,900 grams. It's a female singleton. On the fetal heart rate tracing, there is some concern. It's a category two strip and the baby's in a breech position. So they're already planning to go ahead and do a cesarean under epidural anesthesia, okay? Now we're gonna make like this case is happening at my hospital, Parkland, which is this huge hospital here that you can see in the picture where we have a huge delivery service of over 13,000 births. We're in Dallas, Texas, so we are, um, highly resourced, and that may be different from where you practice. So I know that not everything I'm going to tell you is going to directly apply to each one of you. So since the maternal and fetal condition um, at this delivery, due to that, um, it's, this delivery is planned to be imminent, we need to do the very first step of the algorithm, which is that we need to do some antenatal counseling for that family, and then we need to get our team ready to do their best job. So we need to do team briefing and an equipment check. All right. We all know that antenatal counseling is important. Um, we got to meet with these parents because these and these discussions can sometimes be quite difficult. We have a lot of complex information that we'd like to convey. The parents are often very stressed. And it's important for you to have an idea of both your national and local outcome data and to understand the limitations of each before you go in that room to offer some counseling. So if necessary, consult with a specialist at your regional referral center to really obtain up-to-date information. Um, when you're doing that counseling, obviously we feel like there are things that we should consider beyond just gestational age and estimated fetal weight. We know that gender can make a difference, whether the baby is a singleton or a multiple, and whether that mother has received antenatal steroids. Now, ideally, both the obstetric provider and the neonatal provider should be present to talk to the parents together. I don't know how often that happens at your place. Sometimes it's a big challenge at Parkland. Um, but certainly at those lower gestations, perspectives between the OB team and the neonatal team may differ. And such differences really need to all be discussed before meeting with the parents so that the information is consistent and not confusing. So here's my local um, Parkland outcome data. And um, this is current through um, births through June of 2022. We have the gestational age along the, sorry, along the x-axis here, and then percentage of survival in black bars and in the blue bars, survival without severe illness. And at 33 weeks, um, obviously we have very high survival, close to 100%, as well as high survival without illness. So for this mother, we're gonna be able to tell her some good news, but also we're gonna have to warn her about the time that it will take for the baby to be in the NICU and all of those sorts of things. So as we're preparing to get a good idea for our team, we gotta make sure the team that's gonna be helping us is very aware of the gestation of the baby, what the status of the fluid is, whether it's clear or meconium stained, what other risk factors are present in this case, preeclampsia and moms on magnesium. And then what is the plan for cord management? Those are the four questions that will help the team get ready to prepare. Now. A high functioning team really performs a structured pre-resuscitation briefing. And when possible, it should occur well before the birth. One way to assure that teams get the opportunity to assemble prior to a delivery is to schedule a meeting with the obstetric team at the beginning of each shift to identify potential high-risk births. And we found this very helpful um, in our large delivery system. This allows both the obstetric team and neonatal team the opportunity to meet face-to-face. -face. We can assign roles for who's going to do what in the delivery room, answer questions, and create both a primary plan for what we think will happen and then some contingency plans in case things don't go according to our, our plan. We need to review the risk factors and any plan of care that was developed during the antenatal counseling with the parents, identify the team leader, discuss possible scenarios that the team might encounter, a 
assign the roles and responsibilities. And there's really three essential elements. That's defining the situation, assigning the roles and setting clear detailed expectations for each role. And then in addition, positioning each team, team member optimally within the resuscitation environment. And so here's a sample schematic for a five member team that may be way more people than you ever get in your delivery room, but this would be typical for a very high risk delivery at Parkland. Um, where we assign, we know that there's a person at the head of the bed is going to do airway and then work on access. For this person here is the person who's going to be actually doing the positive pressure ventilation, the breathing assistant. Um, this person on this side over here will do circulation. Um, and then we have very importantly, a scribe who is recording what the team is doing and how the baby is responding. And then if you can, it's really great to have a leader who is not hands-on, who can really maintain a big picture and be a good communication person since they're not having their hands intimately involved in the actual work. Um, it's important that you have a standardized setup for your supply cart, your monitors, your timer, um, any equipment stand that you think you might need. And you wanna have this set up the same way in every delivery room, in every operating room, so that anytime any person goes in, they know exactly where to put their hands to get what they need um, and where they are supposed to stand. The standardization really, really is important and helps. You need to record, like I said, a standardized resuscitation recording form is important. Um, within the NRP instructor toolkit that the American Academy of Pediatrics puts out, there's a lot of different excellent examples of recording sheets that you might utilize. Um, I'm just giving you an example from my own hospital here. But the reason this is so important is because high functioning resuscitation teams look critically at what they actually did and then do constant quality improvement to say, I've got to have a record of what was really done. Um, so that I know how we can debrief and how we can improve for next time. It's really helpful to do those debriefs after the resuscitation in a timely manner. And then it's also helpful to have a higher level leader um, who looks at those records and reviews them for patterns of issues and offers feedback and systems fixes and makes sure that the, the systems issues get fixed. And that's really my role at Parkland. Um, I review all the resuscitations and try to take that on. We have a resuscitation conference every two, week, two weeks, um, a public forum where we discuss difficult cases and what the team did and what they might consider doing next time to do it better. It really forces our teams to continually reflect on their performance and look for those opportunities for improvement. And we really, within that, try to build a culture of open communication and debriefing amongst the team. Not punitive, not finger pointing, but saying, hey, this was not our finest moment. What were the things that led to us not performing as well? And what could we do differently next time? And then we practice that. Having a standardized equipment checklist is very important. Um, this is just part of one that, um, this is not the whole checklist, obviously, but this is part of one from the um, NRP program. But if you have a checklist um, that your teams can use, um, that can be extremely helpful. So in preparation for a moderate preterm delivery, obviously we're gonna need adequate trained personnel. In our hospital, that would be a neonatologist or pediatrician, a nurse who's trained in resuscitation. We have respiratory therapists. I don't know if you utilize um, such a person in um, India, but these are people that are, are specifically trained in positive pressure ventilation, um, as well as ventilator management, et cetera. And they go with us to the team to do the actual positive pressure um, for us. And then our scribe would be the other key person. In a moderate preterm delivery, we're going to worry about thermal protection. Uh, we want a warm environmental temperature. We need a radiant warmer that is on 100% power. We may need plastic wrap or a thermal mattress, and it would be nice to have warm humidified gases. And we're going to talk about some of the science behind those things. We're going to need a PPV device that can provide PEEP or CPAP, since this is a preterm infant who may have a less compliant lung due to surfactant deficiency. We need appropriate size masks or a superglottic airway, although in a 33-weeker, probably not going to have a superglottic airway that would actually fit. 
And then we need appropriate sized endotracheal tubes and potentially laryngoscope blades for the possibility that we might have to um, intubate. All right. So now we've done our antenatal counseling, we've done our team briefing and our equipment check, and now the baby is coming. And we have had to have some discussion with our obstetrical team about whether to perform deferred cord clamping. So this, we're gonna spend a good bit of time on this science. Um, we looked at these issues of the, um, how to do the best cord management of the preterm infant recently within ILCOR. This is our PCOS question. We said for moderate, very, and extremely preterm infants, less than 34 weeks gestation, does later or deferred cord clamping or intact cord milking or cut cord milking compared to early cord clamping um, help with various outcomes. We defined early cord clamping as less than 30 seconds after birth, and we defined deferred clamping at greater than 30 um, seconds. And we had various lengths of time that were greater than 30 seconds that we were looking at. Um, and there's so many different ways of doing cord management, as you guys probably know, that if we really wanted to compare each one to early cord clamping, that results in a lot of different PCOS questions. But we searched the literature for all information we could find about cord management in the preterm, and then we made comparisons where we had science available. The outcome that we were most um, interested in, our primary outcome was survival to hospital discharge, but we looked at a variety of other secondary outcomes, the usual sorts of morbidities that we're interested in in preterm infants. And then we were looking for randomized controlled trials, cluster randomized controlled trials, or um, all that needed to be in preterm infants less than 34 weeks gestation. And we searched <clears throat> through... Um, July of 2019, when let me tell you, there's been a ton of studies since that time, and we're actually coordinating um, to redo this review next year since there's so much new literature. But at the time, um, there were 42 studies that were in the complete meta-analysis for all the different comparisons. As I mentioned, our primary outcome was survival to discharge, um, later cord clamping, versus early cord clamping for that comparison, there were 23 studies that included over 3,000 newborn infants. And then we did look at seven other comparisons. For the uh, main comparison of deferred cord clamping versus early cord clamping, there were those 3,500 babies. There, in looking to survival to discharge, there was moderate certainty evidence with a relative risk of 1.02 that there was a benefit in deferring the cord clamping on survival. So for, every, for there was 18 um, per 1,000 more infants who survived if they had deferred cord clamping compared to early cord clamping. And in addition, for some of those secondary outcomes that we looked at, deferred cord clamping improved hematocrit at 24 hours and seven days of life, which resulted in less need for blood transfusions, it improved blood pressure, resulting in less use of pressors, but we didn't see any difference in severe IVH, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or neck. And importantly, there didn't seem to be any harm to the mother in the group that got deferred cord clamping. There was no difference in maternal postpartum hemorrhage or infection. So the um, treatment recommendation that came from that systematic review was that deferred cord clamping for at least 30 seconds is reasonable for preterm newborns who do not require resuscitation, mean, um, meaning that they were showing some signs of breathing effort. Um, placing skin to skin with mom or having the OB securely hold the infant in a warm, dry trowel or blanket um, was one way to accomplish this. Very preterm newborns could be wrapped in a warm blanket or the polyethylene plastic. But we did say that there should be no delay if the infant appeared lifeless or placental circulation was disrupted because of things like abruption or cord avulsion or a bleeding placenta previa, et cetera. And we just highlighted once again that this takes really good communication and teamwork with our obstetrical colleagues. What about cord milking? It's very appealing because that can be done quickly so that resuscitation can commence quickly for babies who aren't breathing. Um, we did look at this in our 2021 ILCOR review. 
Um, there were 13 randomized controlled trials involving over 1,100 infants. There was no difference in survival to discharge. That was moderate certainty evidence. Um, cord milking did improve hematocrit at 24 hours and reduce the need for blood transfusion and use of inotropic support. We also, with this technique, did not see any difference in maternal postpartum hemorrhage or infection. So that's cord milking compared to early cord clamping. What about cord milking compared to delayed cord clamping? Because we've already said, hey, delayed cord clamping has benefits on survival. Well, um, there's some studies that were coming out around this time. One is an animal study done in preterm sheep from um, Stuart Hooper's group, and Doug Blank was the uh, primary author. They used 126-day fetal lambs. And these lambs were exteriorized from the mother, intubated and instrumented, and then they got randomized to four different cord management strategies. And in all of them, they were looking at umbilical, pulmonary, and cerebral blood flows and arterial pressures. And they could measure all of those things and then look at the hemodynamic effects on the carotid artery blood pressure and blood flow. And here, I'm just showing you two of the groups. Um, here's the, um, on the, panel that's labeled A to the left, that's umbilical cord milking without placental refill. And on the um, other side, the panel that's labeled D is physiologic to base cord clamping. And in particular, I look at this middle panel here, which is the carotid artery blood flow. And so if you are milking, you're seeing quite a bit of oscillation in the car carotid artery blood pressure, as well as in, in the blood flow if you're doing the umbilical cord milking. In the physiologic-based cord clamping, which is where they were actually allowing deferred cord clamping until the um, animal started breathing, and then they would clamp the cord, you don't see any of that oscillation. You see a pretty consistent carotid artery um, blood pressure and flow. And so seeing that oscillation, I think, you know, raised a question to from the basic science work in the lab as, hey, we know that little preemies is probably not great to have oscillations in the blood pressure um, because that can promote interventricular hemorrhage. Now, this study, that basic science study was being done at the same time that a randomized control trial had already been started by an upcatheria. And he was doing a multinational randomized controlled non-inferiority trial for infants who were 31 weeks and less. Um, he, they were randomized to umbilical cord milking four times or deferred cl cord clamping for at least 60 seconds. And the infants were being stratified by the mode of delivery and the gestational age. And the lower gestational age strata, strata was less than 27 weeks and the higher um, strata was um, less than 30, 28 to 31 weeks gestation. He had planned to enroll up to 1,500 babies, but the trial did get halted at um, an enrollment of around 474 for safety concerns. Now, when you looked at the entire population of those 474 infants, there was no difference in the primary outcome of death or severe IVH. But when you looked at the strata of the smallest, most immature infants um, here in this table, so this is the kids that were 23 to 27 weeks gestation. Um, here is the deferred cord clamping, and then um, to the right is the umbilical cord milking group. Um, and so, of course, there was a difference in the timing of the cord clamp that was planned by the study intervention. But really what you want to look at is down here at severe IVH grade three or four. And in the deferred cord clamping group, it was 4%, whereas in the umbilical cord milking group, it was 22%. And that's what raised the concern and had them, made them halt the study um, overall out of concern that this umbilical cord milking was increasing the risk for a significant IVH. So um, when we did our review, that information was available to us already. And so what we said was that in infants who are 28 to 33 and six weeks gestational age who don't require immediate resuscitation after birth, we suggest, so that's telling you low certainty evidence, um, that intact cord milking is a reasonable alternative to delayed cord clamping. That's weak recommendation, moderate certainty of evidence but that we suggest against intact cord milking for infants who are born at less than 28 weeks gestation. And again, it's a small group of babies. That's a weak recommendation with a very low certainty of evidence. 
So here's another poll. I would like I would like to see how many of you have actually done cord milking. Um, has anybody ever tried that in a moderate preterm newborn? I have to tell you, I personally, my answer would be no, I haven't. Um, not because I couldn't. The recommendation is that we can do that, but I just haven't done cord milking myself. We tend to do the deferred cord clamping, but I was interested in how much uptake there's been across the globe, and I'd love to see what you guys are doing. So if you could go ahead and um, respond to the poll, we'll just leave it open here for 10, 15 seconds. Shall we close the poll? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so um, about 27% of you are saying that you have done cord milking in the delivery room and 73% haven't. And I think that's probably um, true in the United States too, that it, it would be a smaller minority that have utilized the cord milking. Okay, so back to our delivery. At delivery, our moderate preterm baby comes out and it has some respiratory effort, maybe not the greatest of tone. And so we go ahead and do the deferred cord clamping for around 60 seconds. And then we bring the baby over to the radiant warmer. And so the next step in our algorithm is this area of the, what we call the initial steps of stabilization to warm and maintain a normal temperature, position the airway appropriately, clear secretions if it's needed, and then to dry and stimulate. And we know that premature infants like this one are at particular risk for hypothermia because there's an immature epidermal barrier with high evaporative heat losses. They tend to have limited subcutaneous fats. They have an increased surface area to weight ratio, and they have ineffective non-shivering thermogenesis, which all contributes to their risk for hypothermia. We know from our, a review that was done in 2015 and then confirmed again in 2020 that there are oh, now over, but at the time, 36 observational studies that demonstrate the increased risk of mortality associated with hypothermia at admission. Hypothermic infants have increased morbidities such as hypoglycemia, respiratory distress, more intraventricular hemorrhage, and more late onset sepsis. And therefore, to the temperature should be monitored and maintained between 36.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius after delivery. Okay, so we just recently completed a um, systematic review looking at strategies to maintain a normal temperature for the preterm infant. So our PICO question was for preterm infants less than 34 weeks gestation, do any of the following interventions, things like increasing the room temperature to 23 degrees or more Celsius, use of a thermal mattress, use of a plastic bag or wrap, use of hats, heating and humidification of the gases that we use for resuscitation, use of a radiant warmer, early monitoring of temperature, warm bags of fluid placed around a baby, swaddling, skin-to-skin -skin care with the mother, or any combination of those interventions. Those were the interventions we were interested in trying to find the science for. And we compared that to drying alone or with use of a plastic bag or wrap or comparisons between interventions if there were studies that, were, that looked at that. Our outcome, our primary outcome, again, our critical primary outcome was survival to hospital discharge. And then we had various other um, important secondary outcomes. Um, in looking where we had the most science was comparisons of a plastic bag or wrap to no plastic bag or wrap. Looking at the critical primary outcome of survival to discharge, there was 11 randomized controlled trials to draw from. That was over 1,400 babies. This was considered high certainty evidence. The relative risk was 1.05 in favor of survival with the use of a plastic bag or wrap. Um, and with that use, one more infant survived per 1,000. Um, and the number needed to benefit was 24 infants. We looked at the use of a plastic cap versus no cap. Um, and there in an important secondary outcome, there was only one randomized trial, but this was considered moderate certainty of evidence. 
the relative risk was actually six in favor of um, the uh, plastic cap. And I'm sorry, the important secondary outcome was um, normothermia upon admission to the NICU. Um, and with that use of a plastic cap, there were 469 more normothermic infants per 1,000. And the number needed to benefit was only two. So if you're having a major difficulty with hypothermia in your preterm babies, really covering the head quickly with a plastic cap or a plastic bag in some way um, can be quite beneficial. So that review is quite complex. There's a lot of comparisons within it. It is currently in press the, um, for uh, um, at a journal, um, but it, the draft consensus on science and treatment recommendation is available already for you to look at on the ILCOR website. And the summary from that will be coming out in this summary co-star for 2023 in October. And basically in summary, for all newborns, there was evidence that use of a higher environmental temperature, warm blankets for drying and hats was helpful um, for newborns who were requiring resuscitation, the use of radiant warmers and warm humidified gases was helpful. And that for the premature infants, the polyethylene occlusive wrapping and bags when the sodium uh, acetate heated mattresses um, could be helpful in, in preventing um, hypothermia. Now with the mattresses, there was a caveat because there was actually increase in hyperthermia. So if you're gonna use those, you need to be monitoring the temperature very carefully, but frankly, we need to be monitoring the temperature in the delivery room carefully anyway, and adjust our interventions as needed, both to prevent hypothermia, but also to avoid hyperthermia. Okay, so for our baby, we provide warmth. We have a warm room and a radiant warmer. We've got the plastic poncho that we put on them and a wool hat. And then we do those other initial steps of opening the airway, clearing the airway only if it's really necessary. The kid who is either apneic and not clearing their own airway or they're drowning in secretions, those could be suctioned. Otherwise we don't need to suction just routinely. And then we need to stimulate the infant. Now, in our case, this baby, despite us doing those initial steps, now the heart rate has dropped to around 50, and there seems to be ineffective respiratory effort. And so we're at that step in the algorithm where we're assessing. Um, and so the next step then in response to that low heart rate is obviously that we need to start effective ventilation. And so we start positive pressure ventilation with a T-piece. At Parkland, we start with a pressure of 25 over five and a rate of 40, and we start with 30% oxygen in our preterm infants. And we know that for 999 out of 1,000 infants, that is all that we're going to need to do to get that heart rate back up. The idea that we would have to do compressions or medications, that is very, very remote as long as we first focus on achieving effective positive pressure ventilation. So how could we do that? Well, one of the um, ideas that had been proposed to get the lung inflated um, and to get that effective PPV started faster was to consider doing an initial sustained inflation. And so ILCOR did a systematic review looking at the use of sustained inflations. So our population for the review was newborn infants who received PPV due to bradycardia or ineffective respirations at birth. And the intervention was initiation of PPV with a sustained inflation. And we kept this definition of a sustained inflation very broad. We said, if you do anything more than one second, we wanna pull those papers and look at that science. The comparator was PPV without intermittent, with intermittent inflations that lasted less than one second. And then our primary outcome was death before discharge. And then we had various secondary outcomes, um, looking at things like air leaks and need for mechanical ventilation or development of BPD or severe IVH. So again, real quick, how many of you have ever utilized an initial sustained inflation in perhaps in a moderate preterm baby, let's say? And we'll just wait five to 10 seconds on this one. I think you can close the poll. Okay. Right. 
So some have, uh, 38% have done a sustained inflation and 62% have not. Um, I think in the U.S., we have had very little uptake of anything like a sustained inflation. But I know that, you know, in the European Resuscitation Council guidelines um, and the Brits in particular definitely do a couple of shorter what well, sustained inflations, but they do like a couple of, um, I think, like three to four second breaths, and then they start their PPV. Then there's other studies where a sustained inflation has gone as long as, you know, 15, 20 seconds. Um, and that's the science that I'm going to show you next. So um, we did this systematic review. Um, there had been, we had done it in 2015, but by 2021, there were nine additional randomized controlled trials. Um, our critical primary outcome, as I mentioned, was death before discharge from the hospital. There were 1,500 babies um, reported on. This was low certainty evidence. Um, it, the relative risk was 1.09. So there was a, um, but the the 95% um, confidence interval that you see here crosses one, so really no difference. Um, no significant impact on critical or important secondary outcomes. But we had planned an a priori subgroup analysis for the more immature children, so those with less than 28 weeks gestational age. And when we looked at that group um, and for the critical outcome of death before discharge from the hospital, there was data from five randomized controlled trials 852 babies, low certainty evidence, but the relative risk was 1.38 and the confidence interval did not cross one, that there was increased risk of death with the use of a sustained inflation. And so based on that, our treatment recommendation currently is that for preterm newborn infants who receive PPV for bradycardia or ineffective respirations at birth, we suggest against the routine use of initial sustained inflations. Um, but that certainly the, it could be considered in research settings. For term or late preterm infants who receive PPV, um, it's not really possible to recommend any specific duration for initial inflations um, due to there was almost no data. So the very low confidence in effect estimates for the, that group. Okay, what about the use of PEEP? This is important because you got to think about what equipment you want to take with you for a preterm baby. So in newborn infants receiving PPV, we've said it may be reasonable to provide positive end expiratory pressure. And that systematic review um, included um, a, both Edgardo Shields' paper from 2014 and Ruth Ginsburg's observational study from 2018, where use of a T-piece was associated with a greater chance of survival without major morbidity. And it was really not just about the teepees, it was about the use of PEEP. And so I have a video here from Stuart Hooper's lab that he shared. And I think it's just interesting because he, this is a rabbit pup who's just delivered and they're giving PPV without PEEP. And what you want to see is that um, the lung starts to increasingly become white. That's telling you that the lung is inflating. And you see a little bit there. Um, but not, it takes a little bit of time. So that is without PEEP. And now let's look with PEEP, how much quicker you very quickly get um, the lung inflated if you're using PEEP in this lung that is a, pre a premature rabbit pup who has some surfactant deficiency. So the use of PEEP, we can see it in the lab, the ben potential benefit. What about the science available for us, what device, if we want to deliver PEEP, what device is going to be able to do that? So we did um, a PCOS looking, a systematic review looking at the devices for administering PPV at birth. Um, and we were looking at any newborn. We had different comparisons. We compared T pieces to self inflating bags, T pieces to flow inflating bags, and vice versa, all the, the various groups that we could, including self inflating bags with PEEP valves and without PEEP valves. And again, our primary outcome was death before discharge with a variety of the usual secondary outcomes um, for the morbidities that we care about in preterm babies. Um, this study, this systematic review was led by Daniele Trevisanuto from Italy. And um, there were 1,200 babies to look at. It was very low certainty of evidence. And um, when we looked at the critical outcome of death before discharge, um, uh, looking at the use of a T-piece, I should have labeled that a little bit better, but the use of T-piece decreased the risk 
um, at least the direction of effect was 0.74, but the, you can see that the um, confidence interval crossed one. Um, so that left us with um, perhaps 10 per 1,000 fewer infants, but maybe up to 30, 23 fewer to maybe 13 more per 1,000 um, who died in the T-piece resuscitator group than in the self-inflating group. For the critical secondary outcome of bulk bronchopulmonary dysplasia, however, there was a positive effect in reduction of BPD with the use of a T-piece. And so what was recommended for a treatment recommendation was that we suggested the use of a T-piece resuscitator over the use of a self-inflating bag in infants, preterm infants receiving um, PPV at birth. And this was a weak recommendation with very low certainty of evidence. Um, and that came from both the data looking at, we need PEEP, we can't do PEEP very well with the self-inflating bag, even when it had a PEEP valve. And then this benefit on BPD when you were using the T-piece resuscitator. Now we did say, hey, a self-inflating bag should be available as a backup device for the T-piece resuscitator in case of gas supply failure. Um, that's just a practical point. You don't wanna be left with no device if you don't have any gas. And then um, there weren't any data to make treatment recommendations for use of TPs compared to flow inflating bags. Those studies just haven't been done. There was no data to, to look at. So we start our PPV in our baby with a T-piece and the heart rate quickly rises. We adjust our oxygen to meet our goal saturations. The baby begins to breathe and we're able to transition over to this side of the algorithm um, where we can transition to CPAP if the baby's having respiratory distress. And there, um, the role of CPAP in the delivery room, um, we know that it can be helpful in establishing the functional residual capacity as long as there's respiratory effort and an adequate heart rate. There were three randomized control trials to look at, hey, should you continue to manage a preterm baby on CPAP or should you go ahead and intubate them? Um, and in those randomized trials from the systematic review, there was a potential benefit for reducing death or BPD. Um, if you um, tried to utilize CPAP more than immediate intubation. There was no advantage for death alone, BPD alone, air leak, severe IVH, NAC or ROP. And so our treatment recommendation was that for spontaneously breathing preterm infants with respiratory distress who require respiratory support in the delivery room, that we suggest initial use of CPAP rather than intubation and PPV. This was a weak recommendation with a moderate certainty of evidence. So in conclusion, um, I think there's a number of complex decisions and tasks that have to be accomplished in a short period of time following the birth of a moderate preterm baby. We need a standardized approach using the best possible evidence. Um, we do have to allow for individual variation in res the response of the neonate, but our goal is always to provide the least invasive support needed, but we have to always be prepared for the worst. And this takes strong communication, teamwork, medical knowledge, and clinical skills. And so I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions. I know I didn't go through the entire algorithm because we already were over time, but I know also I saw in your list of, of lectures that's coming up that you're gonna be speaking with George Schmolzer in a couple of months, and he's gonna be talking about the CPR end of the algorithm and he'll be a great person to do that for you. So we'll leave that for another day, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mayra. It was a, a very elusive presentation and uh, a lot of, uh, I am sure it will uh, provoke a lot of questions as well. I would now re uh, invite uh, the moderators for today, Dr. Surinda and Dr. Vikas to kindly take over the discussion. Thank you. I'm Suranta. Thank you very much. Professor Myra Wyckoff for, for that excellent lecture. I'm from Sri Lanka and uh, I listened to your uh, work, which is very, very impressive at global standard. Uh, by looking at the questions, so we have around eight questions. The first one is, what is the evidence of CPAP in a term baby in a delivery suit? Yeah, so, you know, I focused our case on a moderate preterm, but we have completed a systematic review looking at the use of CPAP in the term infant, because in our algorithm, in the U.S. algorithm, we just said any baby with respiratory distress, you could consider CPAP. Um, in that review that was recently done, um, we didn't find evidence of harm, 
But I have some concerns because in my own hospital, um, we've reported that once we instituted utilizing CPAP in term babies, just because they were grunting, um, we saw an increase in pneumothorax. Now, when we didn't have enough data, when we did the systematic review, there just wasn't enough data from that one study to, to come to a conclusion that it was harmful. But I think we need to continue to do studies and get more data and make sure that that's the case. In my own institution, what we've decided is that we would only utilize CPAP in the term infant if they, in addition to their you know, grunting and perhaps some retractions, had an actual oxygen requirement. And then we've done some more QI work, and that seems to have reduced our risk of pneumothorax if we're focusing it on a population that has both respiratory distress and an oxygen requirement. But that's not an ill core recommendation. That is our practice at Parkland. Thank you, Mara. And the yes. second question is uh, from Chandra Gupta. How many members should be there in a preterm resuscitation team? And there's a comment uh, by Dr. Vanugo Palan. Uh, five person for high risk delivery is not always possible. Three persons is doable. Your views, please. Yeah, I, I I was showing you what we utilize at Parkland, where we are highly resourced, and I recognize that. So I think within each, you know, I would I wouldn't even say we could say for your country you should have this many or that many people, right? Because each hospital and their resources are going to be different. But you want to optimize as best you can. And I think in a preterm baby, you definitely need someone who is skilled in airway management in case you're, even though you can do great PPV um, and potentially try to use CPAP, there are going to be some of those children who will require intubation. So you need someone with those skills. You need someone who can do great job at getting you the assessments that you need to follow the algorithm, which of course is always the heart rate and then secondarily saturations. Um, so you need somebody who can be focused on assessing, getting, if you have the option of putting on a pulse ox, putting the, the probes and leads on, et cetera. Um, and then I, what I really want to stress is that I think it is critical that we start recording real time, not later, not 10 minutes later, not an hour later when you're back upstairs trying to write a note and certainly not writing on your scrub pants like we used to do back when I was a resident. You need a real recorder who's seeing what's happening real time if you want to actually improve your skills and what your team is doing. So um, I think three could be done. I know there's places that have to do it with two. Um, but I think in my system, I really like the five where we have somebody who's hands off, somebody who's recording, and then we have our person who's the assessor, the head of the bed airway person, and the person doing the PPV. That works well in our system. No, uh, Dr. Myra, in our setting in India, what we recommend is uh, whenever there is a high risk uh, factor uh, present, then at least two should be there. At least two. It can be more than two, but not less than two. So what yeah. this and what, NR, what NRP has said is that you know every baby has to have one person yeah, who's yeah. trained is, and focused on them. But if yeah. it's a high risk baby, they deserve a team. And then we don't team. really define what team means. Yeah. So yeah. you have some leeway because you have to adopt this to your clinical situation and your resources. Yeah. So uh uh, another questions are regarding that uh, cord clamping. So there is a lot of issues regarding cord clamping because different, uh, uh, this American Academy Pediatrics 30 seconds, at least 30 seconds. In India, we recommend 60 seconds, mm -hmm. somewhere one to three minutes or physiological cord clamping that is used. But right. what I have seen is that most of the studies, the outcome says that there is no major difference in mortality and other things, whether you defer the cord clamping or not in term babies. But most of these studies have not done intact cord resuscitation. These comparable studies were done when the baby was breathing, then the cord was delayed or not delayed. So I think there is one study going on intact uh, cord resuscitation. So these questions are three. Yeah, three, three, two to three studies. There one study I'm involved in that they have made a specialized neonatal resuscitation trolley for that. Yep. And second point is uh, 
the this question comes to us many a times in our training that suppose uh, whether we should have a baby is limp whether we should immediately cut the cord and take it to the radiant forward or try initial steps on to the mother's abdomen so yeah. whether we should stimulate the baby clear the airway wipe off secretions and do some stimulation then we should carry uh, carry out the, the, what is your take what should we do so i i want to i know that there are different time frames and yeah. the reason that ilcor came out and said at least 30 seconds was not because we thought that 30 seconds was the best it was yeah. that most of the studies that were available to us at the time of the review, yeah. Yeah. they had defined deferred cord clamping as at least 30 seconds or greater. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, so do I know that 30 seconds is the best time? I doubt that it is. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, there's the individual patient meta-analysis called ICOMP that's being done in Australia, and they presented their initial findings at a conference I was in in Australia not too long ago. And and I'm, I'm just their their assessment initially, it hasn't been published yet, but was that two minutes might actually be the best from that data set. So all I'm saying is that the time frame is unknown what the best will be. And that's yeah. why we have to continually continue to scan the literature and redo the systematic reviews to see if we can answer the question better in the future. As far as a kid who is limp and floppy, you are absolutely correct that most of the studies excluded those children from them. And that's why our recommendation, we say, they have to be showing some signs of life for you to do this. If they aren't, go to the radiant warmer. However, that being said, I think it's fine if you can put the baby on the mother's chest to keep the baby warm and do your initial steps there and then say, okay, the initial steps didn't work and go to a radiant warmer. That would be fine too. That's my personal take on it. Yeah. Um, but I think that this area is clearly remains one of the hottest, hottest topics in our field. And I think there's so many important studies that are currently underway. Some have, I, I think are close to completing enrollment and this question of whether we should leave them on the cord and try to resuscitate while still on the cord and get them breathing, um, we will have an answer in the next few years, but we don't have it yet. And we're going to redo the systematic review for preterm babies and cord management next year, knowing that even then that particular question of physiologic based cord clamping versus any of the other methodologies those studies won't be published yet. So we'll have to do it again in another couple of years. And that's that's just the continual review process that is necessary for a group like ILCOR. And uh, the Amsterdam, there is another question from Celia. The, when does ILCOR suggest crossover from three to one ratio of CPR to 15 to two ratio? <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> I won't actually beat my head against the wall, but um, yeah. when I was the chair of the NRP steering committee, I got an email once a week with this question. We understand it is a hot topic that people want an answer for. And here's the truth. There is no science to tell us. So um, we are putting together a group where we're collaborating with the pediatric life support group and the neonatal life support group to try to come up with the best answer that we can for this question. I don't have the answer for you yet, but what, what we say at the American Academy of Pediatrics is look, first of all, there is no science that says that a 15 to two ratio is better than a three to one ratio. In lab studies done in Ola Sogstad's lab and others, George Schmolzer's lab, there's no difference. There's no advantage to the 15-2, but that's just in lab. That's not in babies. That's in piglets. Um, so what you really need to do is within your unit, learn a technique and learn it really well. Okay? And do it. If it's a baby, then most likely even in a kid who's in the NICU, who's been there a while, if they've been there a while, they probably have bronchopulmonary dysplasia and it's a respiratory code. So doing a three to one with more breaths is probably fine. It's probably a good thing. 
If you think it's a cardiac code from hyperkalemia or something like that, then it's okay to do more compressions. But there is no science that one is better than the other. And what I like to remind people of is where did the 15 to 2 come from? Does anyone remember? It was switched by the pediatric life support group because the adults were changing theirs. And even though they had no data that that was a good thing to do for pediatrics, they thought it would be a good thing to only have to teach one ratio to the world. That's why they changed. Not because there was an ounce of data that 15 to two was right thing for pediatrics. So, in, at least we have some data in animal models that three to one providing more ventilation because our codes are almost always with CO2 retention that it at least physiologically makes some sense. But I wouldn't get too hung up on it at this point because just, just learn how to circulate the blood as well as you can using one of those techniques and make sure everybody in your unit knows that methodology so that there's not confusion and one person's trying to do it one way and another another. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. So another uh, point which we usually face, uh, that is a question from Dr. Anil Kumar, that if a baby is born and heart rate is between 0 to 10, so should we go for uh, chest compression and intubation directly, or we should follow the algorithm and do uh, initial steps and PPV and then we should follow it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think what, the way I approach it, when it's zero, and I believe the person who's telling me at zero, which I do believe my nurses, they're excellent. They, they know how to assess a heart rate. And then we get them on the monitor real quick too. Uh, we move pretty quickly to intubation. And if after immediate intubation, there's still no heart rate, then we're moving on to compressions. But we do intubate first because I cannot tell you how many times I'm told we hear nothing. We get the tube in and the heart rate pops up and we don't have to do compressions. And probably that means that the heart rate was there. They just, it was so faint, they couldn't hear it in the chaos of that particular loud OR or something like that. Um, but if there is some heart rate, even when it's really low initially, I would totally focus on providing effective PPV and trying to get the lung inflated and chest rise. Because again, 999 times out of a thousand, if there is some heart rate there, you will pop it up and you will not have to do CPR. And where does that data come from? That comes from clinical data from Parkland Hospital, because we have that huge delivery population and a database where we collect all this resuscitation information. And we do very little CPR, but we are very focused on inflating the lung first. Thank you. And another question is uh, regarding target saturation. Uh, think for there is is there any difference for preterm babies, premature babies, and term babies, or it is the same, or there is any new data which is coming out? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there's a little bit of preterm data from Jennifer Dawson's work out of Australia, um, and it was kind of in line with the term baby data, but as far as like the LGANs and extremely low, we don't have any norms because we don't know what normal is, and they all have lung disease, et cetera. So, we have chosen at this point, given the lack of data, to recommend using the term baby data, uh, saturation goals. But I don't know that that is the best science because we just don't have the science in the tiny kids. We need some more studies and reports for people to really be looking at what the saturations are in the smallest kids. And of course, you know, there are some studies from Ola Sogsted and, and others that have suggested that Maybe it's not a minute by minute saturation goal that we need to worry about as much as getting them above a certain range by a certain time frame. And I know that some of the work that um, Vishal Kapadia and Ola and others have done have suggested that, you know, if you can get over 80% by five minutes and um, that there seems to be an, a survival advantage. Um, that's about the limits of the science that we have, but we certainly don't have minute by minute great saturation ranges for the smallest kids. Vishal Kapadia, who is also at UT Southwestern with me, who's the current chair of NRP steering committee is doing a randomized controlled trial of different oxygen saturation ranges for the kids under 29 weeks gestation. And so that will be some randomized controlled trial data coming, but it's probably gonna be five years before that's 
finished and reported would be my guess. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more thing which I want to ask is that uh, presence of blender is still uh, not a distant dream at every delivery in our country. So okay. we usually do not have blenders available in labor room, resuscitated room. So in our recommendation, what we have said that whenever you start ventilating a preterm baby, you can ventilate without reservoir with the bag because it usually provides 40% of uh, ox FiO2 and mm -hmm. it depends upon the rate of how you are ventilating the baby. But it is approximately 30 to 50% of oxygen which we are giving. Right. So is, is this thing, uh, is there any strict uh, thing that you have to start with 30% only? Or what is the difference between 30 and 50% if you are st uh, starting with that? There's no data. Uh, and I, I would There's just no do, data. I would do exactly what you're doing if I didn't have um, access to a device with PEEP. You're going to have to use a self-inflating bag if, if you don't have a T-piece. And then in that case, um, I would use 100% oxygen with the self-inflating bag and assume I'm getting around 40% to the baby. Yeah. I, I, would, yeah. I don't think you have any other option. Thank you. If you don't have the 100%, I would just bag them with room air. I mean... Yeah, that is correct. That is correct. I mean, th there's plenty of kids that don't actually need any oxygen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. although the tiniest of the tiny typically do. Yeah. Other questions? Sorantha, any more questions? Uh, and uh, there are a few questions on uh, regarding the birth defects. Uh, are there any differences in resuscitation for diaphragmatic hernia? cases as well as the other burst defect like gastroscisis and uh, meningomyelitis, etc. Uh, so uh, I think uh, if you know prior, that's fine. If you don't know it prior, how, how does it difference our resuscitation process? Uh, yeah, we have never done any scientific review at ILCOR of looking at the science behind um, optimizing changes for kids with anomalies. It's been raised as a question and there are people who have a lot of interest um, in that, those kinds of questions, um, but we have not done any scientific reviews. For the NRP program, we just make a cursory mention of you know, some of the things you do need to consider, like for the diaphragmatic immediately intubating and not providing a bunch of PPV so that the bowels distend with air. We mention, I think um, we have some mention for like airway anomalies about the use of pharyngeal <laughs> masks. Um, some things like that, but we don't, we've never done scientific review. That is just um, expert opinion that we have in the NRP program. And it's a really short little chapter bit. Okay. Thank you. I think Dr. Vikas, we have asked most of the questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, yeah. Professor Myra, to having such a good discussion. And uh, we can see the future things which are coming. Uh, and I am uh, very much delighted to hear you because as an implementer of these uh, guidelines, we face a lot many questions and infrastructure things and personnel things everywhere. So uh, as I tell everybody that we should blend according to our availability of infrastructure and everything, but ventilation is the most important thing whether you do it self self inflating bag or tps or anything the most important thing is uh, ventilating a baby and maintaining the initial steps throughout the uh, course of resuscitation because it's a misnomer like initial steps it is not initial it has to be taken uh, care of during the resuscitation process because most of the times Temperature is not maintained when they are starting the resuscitation till last of the resuscitation. Clear I, like to compare, I like to compare the different algorithms, which, you know, since they're based on the same science, they're, they're usually not that different. But the, the Australians and, and the Brazilians, I think, too, definitely the Brazilians, down the whole algorithm, they have a huge arrow that that the whole way down that says maintain normal temperature in big, bold letters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that is the need. And third thing, which uh, which we all know, 
that you should ventilate within one minute of the birth. The baby should be ventilated if the baby is not breathing. So these are the important things. And we are looking forward for many new things which are coming, many new recommendations, and we will change accordingly. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I, my, my suggestion is to really, um, now that I have your name, <laughs> when, when new ILCOR consensus on science and treatment recommendations come out, um, we can get that information to you and the link and you can send it out to your people so we can get your perspectives on that. Yeah. Yeah, from that here, I think uh, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Vikas. Uh, one thing is maintaining temperature. Uh, some of our resuscitation, it's, uh, uh, I mean, maybe moderately equipped. Uh, and then the ventilation is the most important thing again and again. And uh, uh, one important point from uh, Professor Myra is uh, uh, when you practice something, be thorough with your steps. Uh, it may be, I mean, I'll call what uh, it may be the UK guideline or the Australian. The shuttle differences are there, but uh, you have to thorough with whatever you practice. And we are fortunate to listen to uh, uh, Professor Myra Wyckoff. Uh, and we are really privileged. Uh, I think uh, in Sri Lanka, most of us uh, follow UK guidelines. But when we listen to you, I mean, uh, it's very, really, very really comprehensive, evidence-based, very strong guidelines. And I hope in future, uh, we as a country, we will collaborate more with the uh, NNF and as well as the, we ha can have access to North American, uh, these uh, studies and guidelines. Thank you, uh, Professor Maida on behalf of uh, Sri Lankan uh, Medical Fraternity. Thank you. Thank you so much once again, uh, Professor Maida Vaikov. Uh, uh, for that excellent lecture and uh, uh, great moderators, Dr. Suranda Pereira and Dr. Vigas Goel. Before we uh, end the session, I uh, would invite uh, uh, Dr. Suryanda Singh Bisht, who is the Secretary General of National Neurology Forum India, uh, to make his closing remarks. And before that, again, one more housekeeping announcement. Uh, friends, uh, we will continue with the second part of what's new in restoration. Uh, in October, as uh, Myra was remark, uh, uh, mentioning on the lessons from the chest conversion and survive uh, trial by Professor George M. Schumzler. And uh, before that, we had two sessions coming up in September on two issues all of us who practice neonatology face. One is the ethics and the legend in eth the ethics, Professor Mark R. Makurio is going to talk to us about the, uh, a fair, understandable and feasible approach on 7th. September and uh, another uh, topic that we all face at some point of time and then we fight to get it over with sepsis. So you seek, seek neonates with negative blood cultures by a legend who is known for the something else also. He is a true legend. He has formulated the uh, PDA, AP guidelines and things like that. So uh, he is going to talk to us about that. Professor William Bennett's. That is on 21 September. So these are two sessions of September before we go back to neonatal restoration in October. Now, I would request Dr. Surinder Singh Bish to, uh, for his closing remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Manoj. First uh, of um, a, a great thank from uh, National Autology Forum uh, for uh, having such, uh, uh, such, luminary, such luminary giants coming and actually interacting with um, our uh, fraternity in India and this part of the world. And thank you, Dr. Myra. Uh, I'm really, um, I want, I noted down, in fact, I don't note down all the things, but today I, I wanted to jot down. And I, you started off with good things like um, antiretal counseling. That was so important. The the questions, uh, that that is something which we forget in, in, in our heat up to or run up run up to the algorithm, running through the algorithm, how to talk to patients. Then having a team standing there, coming and looking at the algorithm and then actually delegating tasks to each other, that was certainly important. And all the recent systematic reviews which you said actually are so, so relevant to uh, National Autology Forum because it is actually taking the babies for immediate golden hour care or care 
beyond just resuscitation because you are talking about uh, hypothermia, you are talking about survival through hypothermia, then there is PEEP and BPD related to that survival uh, with PEEP. And that hat, having a plastic hat, was such a good idea. And uh, cord milking and delayed cord clamping, certainly, with very good uh, evidence uh, showing towards survival, which one uh, RR of 1.02 was certainly something which was important. And Katheria, Dr. Katheria, who was also a speaker, was the first speaker, in fact, uh, in this uh, series. Uh, he, there was a good evidence not to do umbilical cord milking. Uh, with this, I think, uh, Dr. Manoj, uh, having Myra here, having Myra tell us, and we are looking forward uh, in upcoming years during the situations, more of neonatal concerns and the neonatal care being actually starting off from time zero. So I think that is what is important. And all that means so, so much for all the neonatologists. Thank you. I was uh, mentioning to Myra that we should have her in person. Anytime soon. Yeah, sure. Sure. That would be fun. So next year, Manoj. Next year, Manoj, you have the you have the ball in your court. He will be the chairman of scientific committee. <laughs> so uh, 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 before we close, I would like to thank uh, all our uh, respected attendees who had been attending at uh, 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 various time zones from all over the globe. Uh, <laughs> who are part of this program since June 2020. It has been a long journey, very encouraging journey to learn from each other. This knowledge process, knowledge sharing process has taken a long stride. And then with uh, legends like today, Professor Myra Wyckoff, the original researchers in the various field, tell, I mean, uh, giving us uh, a, I mean, a chance to introspect on our practices. Uh, it's uh, it's a great feeling and all the uh, credit for this goes on to the um, more than now the number has gone up to more than 10,000 uh, registrants who have been part of this uh, series at some point of time or the other. I would like to uh, 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 profoundly thank all of you for joining us today. Looking forward to meeting you again in the next session on Sept uh, September 7th, uh, that is on ethics, neonatal ethics, as I mentioned. And uh, before I close, once again, special thanks to three people who made today's session possible. Of course, the legend, Professor Myra Wyckoff, uh, and of course, the moderators, uh, Dr. Surinda Pereira. Surinda and uh, Vikas. Thanks, thanks from NNF, uh, Surinda and Vikas. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll keep meeting. It's a small place. Yeah. <laughs> it's a smaller world. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye.